Thank you for listening to the Nate Jackson Podcasting Network. Okay, you know what would be amazing? If you left a five-star review on iTunes. Go ahead. Just do it. What up, beautiful people? It's Nate Jackson. This is Super Funny Comedy Club, and this is uh, Everything I Just Said's podcast. I am uh, blessed, happy, touched. Uh, just, I'm, just, I'm just enamored, elated uh, by what we're doing now. I don't like a whole bunch of stuff before we find out why I'm happy. I'd just be saying it. Alonzo Bowden's here. Thank you. Thank you. And you have not been touched. And let's be real clear about that. No, I was touched. Because in today's environment, you saying you was touched. I, 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 I don't have the money for that lawsuit. You know, the so. court just threw out Wade's case. <laughs> so a lot less people have been touched than we thought. Michael Jackson didn't do it. How about that? Um, so I want to just get into this. Um, it is May now. Uh, May 1st. And so I imagine the next time I see you, uh, June 13th will have passed. So I'm going to go ahead and issue me the first and earliest happy birthday. Wow. Okay. I'm getting it in there. Thank you. I'll take that. I appreciate that. Yes. Appreciate that. And yeah. so um, I've done a ton of research and followed you myself in my own 15-year my own, uh, career and uh, love what you do. I love that you have set your own path uh, and didn't go the ways they told you to go. Yeah. I, you know, People have always asked, like, what's my career path been? And I've always said it's the next indicated thing, right? So it was the next thing in front of me. But mm. it was, um, I started in the early 90s, right? I started in the Def Jam era. Yep. But I wasn't a Def Jam guy. Right. And that, and and obviously no disrespect to that because that is was huge. And, and there was some great comics coming out of it. But it wasn't something I could walk in and pretend to do. Mm. You know what I mean? Like, That'd be authentic. Like, right. So so I came from a more mainstream, you know, I tell everybody, like, look, I grew up in a black neighborhood and I went to white schools. So I never learned to hate white people properly. You Hilarious. Know? So, <laughs> but no, it was always, um, I've always been in that, I don't know how to put it, in that mix, in that middle ground, being aware of both uh, b- both sensibilities. Yeah, I'll put it that way. And And my comedy comes from that. And then I've always been a news junkie. So that happened during uh, last comic where I just started having more fun doing topical observations than talking about my life. Right. So that that's how that came about. Cool. So I just saw uh, I, it's what I want to say and, and, and the questions I want to ask are, are loaded up. So I'm having to break it down, and you're fire giving away. you're already no man fire away. Unbeknownst anywhere. to you, you're already saying things that I'm like, ooh, ooh trinket, trinket. Okay, so <laughs> before we started the show, I just want to say this for the listeners who are not watching it. Before we start the show, in the Nate Jackson Super Funny Comedy Club studio, we have a box on the table, and some people don't care what it is. Other people are curious spirits. Alonzo picked it up and said, what in the hell is up in this box? <laughs> <laughs> has that always been you or is that curiosity always, always. growing in you? As a, as a kid, you know, my first career, I was uh, an airplane mechanic. Oh, right? no, no. You were a jet mechanic at Lockheed Martin yeah. and you worked in Long Beach. Right. And I've done a bunch of stuff there. And people say, where does it come from? When I was a kid, I always wanted to see how things work. So I'm I took them apart from, way. you know, from like my first bicycle, like. Okay, like I got to take this apart. I got to see how it works. So yeah, there's always been a natural curiosity, mm. you know. So I'll tell you what my thought was when I saw this, uh-huh. right? And you, and you people on camera can see this box. It's a beautiful box. I thought I said, oh, is this a chess set? Has he been watching the Queen's Gambit? Like, did he jump ah. into this chess thing? Because that's what it looks like. I, yes, I watched Queen's be, Gambit, but that is just where we hide yeah, stuff tables that we need. And, yeah. and tech stuff. But this could be a chess set in this box, and you know, a serious one. Yeah, if that yeah, had yeah, chess pieces real, in right. it, that would have been like a, this. This is one of those chess sets where you don't play the person who owns it. You know what I mean? He like, oh, no, they play Set chess. This yes. ain't nothing there. You play yourself on that kind of. No one plays against me on this. I beat yeah. myself. Um, so, so you have the curious spirit, right? I, I share that same uh, situation. And then, uh, also, I've always so I, I my original major was aeronautical engineering. I went to Florida for it and everything, and then oh, I ended okay. up going back to Washington. I ended up just falling in love with comedy during college mm-hmm. and just switching to communication so I could get out. And start doing it. Because my mom said, not without a degree. You could. So <laughs> I did that. So uh, what I'm saying, beget, do you think that uh, the comedian's minds, some of our greatest, like th- to be the greatest, you have to have that inquisitive? Oh, yeah. C- comedians are all, I think, if not all, 
most are naturally curious. Mm-hmm. And what we're curious about, we're curious about the human condition. Okay. Right? That's, that's what we're like, why do people do what they do? Why do people think? And we notice things. Comedy's in the details, right? So we notice some little thing that people do or, the, or whatever, and we comment on it. And then people laugh because they realize, like, oh, yeah, that's right. People do that. Or, or you know what I mean? Like, yeah. so, so I think um, comics have a natural curiosity. And um, also another thing that, that helps with comedy is a natural dissatisfaction. Hilarious. Right and like general disdain for everything. Disdain, going like on. we could do better. Yeah, like what the hell's wrong with this? Right, right. Why did? Why is this stupid thing? You know, and 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 it's funny because people think people think comics are down on everything, mm. right? But we're not down on it. We just know we could do better. That part. So you, so you're like we're pointing this out because we know we could do better. You know, or when when I say we. I mean, like society or or the boss at work or whatever. You know, that's that's why you point it out because you're like, man, what are you, what are you dumb? Right. And then when we say it, then other people are like, oh, hey, you're right. You know, you're right? And, and, and oh, there is a better way to do it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we yeah. thought of it because we love taking things apart and putting it back together, or right. at least the concept of being able to. Now, you mentioned in a viral clip that just went nuts in 2020, where you talk about how difficult it is to be a com- comedian right now. You mentioned, and you also mentioned now, keeping up on the news. Yeah. But what jumped out at me in the thing was you said, I was reading this story. Now, most people, if we watch the news and keep up on stuff, literally we're watching the news. So how much of your process is reading the news, like the newspaper? I so rarely watch news. Really? I read news all the time. I mean, I grew up like... um, we had two newspapers growing up. We got the morning, in the morning, the daily news came, and then in the afternoon, they had a paper called the Long Island Press. So we got two newspapers a day, and I grew up in the habit of reading those. And what happens with, with staying on top of the news, you know, TV is the highlights, right? But the, but when you read it, you mm. get to read the whole story. That's true. You do get some more. You get the whole, you know, the, the you it's not the three minutes you saw on the nightly news. There's more to the story. So I've always been in the habit of reading it. Also, reading it, you can kind of get past the bias, right? Because there's, there's always a, you know, I've, Fox News is, you know, ridiculously biased. To the right. And, and MSNBC is somewhat biased. But I would say, like, if Fox oh, yeah. News is 90% right, MSNBC is 30% left. I'll give you that. It's, it, and then I, we expect CNN to be right down the middle. I hate the false equivalency because it's not. Yeah, and we expect CNN to be down the middle. But the problem with CNN and the problem with, with news in general, right, it's become infotainment. You know, it's become they're going for ratings. They have good-looking anchors who read stuff. But when you get when you start reading the news, and, and I have a lot of news feeds that I read, you just learn more about it. You get more points of view, mm-hmm. you know, right? Read the BBC. Read the British. They they do news. Do they? They do. And not only do they do, do news, they look at us. They look at America and they're like, well, what about this, this, and this? So it, it almost gives you an, an outsider's view of our country. You know, like for example, with the whole Black Lives Matter racism movement, it's nice to see other countries watching us. Yes, and protesting with us. Yes, and understanding because the they're, they're like, you know, no, America, your your no, your hands are not clean. Right. You can you can no longer pull the, you know, what about your human rights? And they're like, what about your human rights? Like, you still killing black people. How about it? <laughs> right. <laughs> you over here worry about what so, we do, and you got right. black people still since slavery held down. Right, yeah. right. So Systemically. I um. So, yeah, I like reading news. I like um, having a general idea what's going on it's also just interesting sometimes some stories are just interesting you know right so we open up the news to the international uh perspective where in the world have you had the most fun on stage wow that that's such a a tough question internationally my favorite place hold on first let's give them context because you've done extensive USO touring (laughs) I have done I've done comedy everywhere in the world they speak English and through the USO and the military, I've gone a lot of places they don't speak English. Um, actually, I've done comedy everywhere in the world except South America. That's the only really? that's the only place I haven't been because we don't have military there, 
officially. And, you got to uh, go home. <laughs> You're black in Honduras. No, go no, home I have, and do a show. No, I have done shows. I have done shows in Honduras. Because okay. we, we do have a military base there. Ah. But I'm talking about, you know, Brazil and, okay. and Argentina and places, you know. I'd like to go to Brazil, but I don't know my jokes I want to tell. Exactly. I I'm, I'm, go to Brazil. <laughs> Everyone <laughs> says once you go to Rio, that's just, yeah, Rio's, Rio is Rio, you know. You know place is cracking when they just say but, it is what it is. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but um, so my favorite international place is, is Montreal. Just for Laughs Festival. That that is my favorite. That is the world. I don't know if it's still the world's biggest comedy festival, but it's where everybody comes together. It's like summer camp it for is. comics. And so I've explained JFL a couple different ways on different shows. So essentially, I think JFL is a, a phenomenal experience on festival and off festival. Yeah. And I, but I also think it is the it's the crux it's the crux of the matter in regards to the problems with the industry right now yeah i can see that so I'll, and the only reason i say this jfl is such an extensive and phenomenal comedy experience to be exposed to comics from all over the world that it makes people who should be looking for new talent and all that just wait for jfl yeah and that's not conducive because it's once a year Right, but and this is what I tell. Well, see, I have my personal experience with JFL. Right, is huge and phenomenal. Yes. So that so I'm always going to be a fan. Right, I got discovered at just for, at JFL at New Faces. Nice, and that was back when you could make a deal at the festival, which I did, at and the, uh, I got a deal at the festival. Well, pretty much at the open bar. Pretty much, that's how it went. I did, I did uh, New Faces. And they come rushing you after the show, you know, I'm with NBC, I'm with yes. with this studio, I'm this. And they start giving you business cards, right? And you're like, I don't know who any of you are. Like, I knew enough to not say anything. You know right. what I mean? Just, and just wait and we'll, pan, we'll figure it out just later. Just give those cards to my manager and let him do the talking. And then we had some meetings and um, I ended up signing with William Morris. Nice. And they started having, it was, it, this was the funniest thing, Nate. Once I did New Faces... I couldn't go anywhere in Montreal without a William Morris agent being there. Period. They were like, you need something from the bar? Yeah. Can yeah, I get they, you lunch? They like they, they, it was really funny. Like it would be a, it's like a woman having not just a stalker, a team of stalkers, yep. right? Because that's what they're doing. And even they're, when you think you're alone. Yeah. They're, they're you pull out a cigarette and they're like, need a light? <laughs> like, whoa, where the fuck did you just come yeah. from? Uh, William Morris and Dick. Yeah. They're recruiting, but it was fun and it was, it was a learning experience. Right. So, so we came back, made a deal. And the, the great thing about it was the money allowed me to quit my day job and start my comedy career. And Wonderful. then I went back to JFL two years later to do a gala and then they just started, uh, well, the galas are the big comedy show. Right, but it's usually a person's show. got like no, Tiffany Haddish got a little bit. No, 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 okay. no. I wasn't that famous. I was there to perform on a gala. Gotcha. But but even so, doing a gala is a big deal because it's a big televised thing in Canada. And then I th I don't know how many times I've been there. Like they just start bringing me back, and now I'm so much a part of the the furniture. Right, <laughs> I'm just. <laughs> So, so used to being there that uh, when Kenya Barris came, this was funny to me. So Kenya Barris was getting an award and I happened to be hosting. Two years ago. Yeah. I think three years ago. I think this was three years ago. His first time there. Okay. So I was hosting the JFL Awards. But anyway, he looked for me. Okay. And he said, Alonzo. And I said, yeah. He said, yo, man. They told me when I get to Montreal to check with you. They said, you the mayor. You know what's happening. So what is up? And he asked me where this was and that was. And the funny thing is, I don't know if you had this experience, where someone asks you some shit and you know it. Like, you don't even right. realize you yeah, knew oh, you're it. Right but there, you're yeah, like, right yeah, there, yeah, this is. And then I was like, oh, shit, I guess I do know, you know. But that was that was really cool. Then I asked him, you know, why ain't I on one of his shows? And he, Hilarious. I haven't seen him since. Uh, so <laughs> but, so no. oddly enough, but, our, our paths crossed Kind of in the same scenario. So I was at the all the open bar party. Yeah. Uh, when Kenya got whatever deal he got. Right. So he comes in and he's chilling. You know yeah, what I'm saying? Big dumbass deal. chain on, chilling. Right. Netflix deal on the spot in the party. Mm -hmm. And when I tell you something happened, I walked around the party once and came back and he was damn near breakdancing. 
And I'm like, Mr. Barris, Mr. Barris. And I catch up with him. And he's like, uh, he's like, um, I said, I just need your email. That's all I need, and I'll reach out that way. And he was like, fuck white people. Uh, fuck, whitey, <laughs> fuck whitey at gmail.com. I was like, what? <laughs> like, that was legit. And I'm yeah. like, I wonder is that real? And somebody else verified, like, no, it really is yeah. fuck whitey. And he got to do it. Like, so you're telling me you got to deal as a black man with Netflix with stuff going back and forth over email, and they have to type in fuck whitey at gmail.com <laughs> to cut the deal. Kenny is really, really popped from there. And yeah, so well, it, I like I my experience at JFL, I'll just mm-hmm. share this. Yeah, yeah. Is that so I have not done on festival yet. Mm-hmm. Would love to. Um, you know, I've showcased a couple times. I have another one coming up on shit at a Dynasty Typewriter on this Monday the seventeenth. Mm-hmm. And I'm hoping this is the one because I keep I've been going straight to callbacks for the last couple of years, and I'm hoping this is the one I can get a new face. Uh but what I did do was Kevin Hart had his own Right, Kevin Hart did the LOL. Off, yeah. yeah, and so mm-hmm. Pookie hit me and was like, what you doing yeah. next week? I'm like, uh, what, why? You know what I'm saying? You yeah. got a passport? Yep, yep, let's go. So I go up, I do JFL, Montreal. Um, I was hip-pocketed at that time by um, Three Arts. Mm-hmm. Hit, just hip pocket. And so, but I, I, the guy I worked with at Three Arts was an assistant. He was just trying to get the managers to see me. Yeah. Everyone's so busy. Oh, Montreal's coming up. Oh, we'll see him when we get back. Oh, we got to run Kevin's thing. We don't have. So he's like, look, I'll just have everybody at that showcase. Like, that'll be when I can get as many of them there. Half of them are there anyway because there are other talent right. is there. Mm-hmm. And so I go in and I, and I knock it out. Now, I'm upstairs chilling in the mezzanine with Tamara Goins and uh, Innovative. Uh, and um uh, Right before, two acts before I'm supposed to go on, I go downstairs and get my jacket, and then I go out and I do my thing, and then I come back, and Tamara's like, what did you just do? And I'm like, why? Well, I had fun on stage. And she's like, no, 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 no. After you left, Becky comes in, stands for your set, and then when you start your closer and it's killing, he walks out. Everybody in here wants to know who's the kid Dave Becky just came to see. Yeah. And then I had the experience you had without even being on festival. Mm-hmm. And then immediately it was like, oh, you're not hip pocketed no more. And that. So JFL is magical in that yeah, regard. For some. Because people know. come with the checkbook open, ready right. to do opportunity. People, like, people, like, it's, it's, it's the draft, right? We're like we're in the middle of the NFL draft. That's like. I felt like slave trade, but I feel comics you. draft. You know, that, that's, <laughs> that, but that's how it works. And, and I tell everyone, the thing about getting to a festival, any of the big festivals, the great thing is. Everyone sees you there, you know, that it, it, rather than trying to showcase at 20 clubs or, or 10 different network showcases or whatever, everyone sees you They're all in one there. place. So that's the great part. Now, it is not like it used to be. They don't make the deals up there that they used to, okay. but because it's grown so much. Like when I did New Faces, remember, you remember, I'm old, man. It's, there was no Internet. Mm. So they didn't know who we were at all. You were and a new face. A few places knew, but what JFO would do was they brought us up, like the festival started Monday. Okay. They brought us up Wednesday. We stayed in a different hotel than everybody else. You yeah. know, this is back when it was at the Delta. We were in some little hotel, and they would do the show, and you would come out, and a lot of people didn't know. They l- literally didn't know who you were. You were the new faces, and so the good thing about that was – all the industry would come because they all wanted to see who's the new faces. You had to what's happened now because of internet and social media and every other form of publicity, people know who it is and they have different new faces. They have unsigned new faces. Yes. They have, you know, some people on new faces, their careers are already bigger than mine. I'm like, the hell are you doing on new faces? You know? And then you have new faces of sketch, which is a different, Yep. type of comedy. So like everything else, it's grown. It's gotten bigger. They partnered with more TV and do more TV. It used to be like at, when I did first did JFL, damn, I feel old when I talk like this. But it's true. There would How old are you? There would be, I'm 58. Okay, I didn't want to. Yeah. Well, no, there'd be. Based on my questions, you know I know that shit already. Yeah, but there'd be <laughs> three, there'd be like three comics that did one hour. Right, but so 58 now, but you're talking about I'm talking about this is 1997, 98, 99. This is back then. So this is 22. 30. You're 22 years old? No, this is 22 years ago. 22 years ago. Yeah. Okay, so you're in your third. Th- Got uh, it. Yeah. So I've been I'm doing 37 comedy 28 right now. years. This is my 28th year in comedy. Okay. So you this what you're talking about right now is where I'm at in my life and career and age and everything. Okay. 
That's right. Just to give you perspective, like, okay, little me. Right. No, so what I'm what but what I'm saying is back then there were maybe two or three people did a one hour. You know, now there's a whole series of yeah. one hour specials being recorded. Like this is how much the festival has grown. Yeah. I, I, what blew my from, mind was they had all our specials from just Australians. Yeah, yeah. Then just, just like right. Yeah, I was like, okay. And it used you so so the whole thing has grown. So it so I love being part of it. But when you talk about internationally, you know, I've done Australia, right? I've been to Sydney, I've been to Melbourne, um, I've been to Hong Kong. I, I did Saudi Arabia two years ago. Uh, I finally made it to South Africa. Oh, wow. Um, That's where I was when the pandemic hit. I had just finished doing the South Africa Comedy Festival, and it was phenomenal. Really? It was an amazing, yeah. Cape Town, just one of the most amazing, beautiful cities I've been to in the world. Despite their history. Yeah, and I I was joking about that. I said, "Mm, a lot of white people here. Right. Didn't expect that. Thought you got rid of them. You know, <laughs> yeah, that's what they were saying. Like, if you guys are still here, we were gonna take our land back. No, it was um, it was very cool and very very interesting. And the history being there is very interesting. Now, Cape Town is a diff like Africa is as a continent. There's so many different parts. I yeah. can't say you know, oh, this is what Africa was like. I can say this is what Cape Town was like. Yeah. But that was a very interesting, very cool trip. So, the the travel that I've had in my life. I've considered that a side benefit of comedy. Like I didn't get into comedy saying I'm going to see the world, mm-hmm. but now as a result of comedy, I've seen the world. And, and again, these are the things that change your perspective tremendously. I think um, Tony Rock had like the best line I heard about travel. You know, Tony said, once you've been to Italy, you can't shoot somebody over a pair of Jordans. Right. Yeah. Because you've been given some perspective. You see how big the world is. Too many people, especially here in the America, in the United States, Americans don't see how big the world is. They don't know so, how big their own city is. Right. But too many Americans think that the United States is the world. And then when you see the world, it puts everything in perspective, like like how young we are. That part. And the other thing that's actually crazy is uh, what we've been shown our whole lives and told in schools. And then you get to the place where you've been looking in textbooks going, this don't look like that. Yeah, the middle. That's how I describe the Middle East. Middle and I, East. I, I, I did Qatar or Qatar. Yeah, mm-hmm. uh, it was me, Lunell, and uh, J Mac for New Year's Eve for the Allied Forces there, uh, where we uh, we were on the base where some of the planes you yeah. helped make were. Mm-hmm. Um, but we had all the Allied Forces, and it was just nuts to see. Like I went to Bahrain, Abu Dhabi, all of that, and I'm I'm thinking this is just going to be a dry ass, dirty little desert. Uh, and and it is the biggest mall I've ever seen in my life. There's people skiing in the mall. There's people riding horses in the mall. There is a swimming pool. You can surf in the mall. Right. Like it was just, there was a river. There was a river. I'm not even talking in the mall. It was a river. I went on a cruise mm-hmm. with the, I'm an Omega, Omega Sci-Fi. I went on a cruise with the Qs in Abu Dhabi. I'm talking 70 black female teachers <laughs> that are all over there. <laughs> Teaching Qatari kids English, and then fifty cues to go with it. Had a great time. I was like, "This yeah. is this blows all perspective." Right. The Middle East is not what you see on TV, man. And it's it's a completely different culture, <laughs> but it's a culture that works for them. And that's one of our problems internationally is not having respect for other cultures mm. that work. You know, and I'll tell you, this, did you have any experience, or did they tell you anything about the Bedouin tribes? Tell me, because I don't. So the Bedouin tribes in the Middle East. How how are you saying that? B-E-T-T-A? No, B-E-D-O-W-I-N. I I believe that's how you spell it. Bedouin. Bedouins. Okay. These are the ones who wander the desert and have been wandering the desert forever. And they're allowed to, like, they don't have to worry about border crosses. These are the the nomadic tribes, like raising goats. How the hell do you raise goats in a desert? But these are are the, the old nomadic tribes that walk around. And I was like... You think you're a badass? Like, these people live on the desert. Like, they live off the land in the Middle Eastern desert. How tough are you? Right. Like, however tough you think you are. You, oh, you really? Let's, yeah, put, go, let's put that go up roll, against Go Crippen. roll with a Bedouin for a month. <laughs> how about that? And come back and tell me how bad you are. They, 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 like, you would, you would pass just a lump of straw. And they're like, hey, what's that? Oh, that's a Bedouin house. You know? <laughs> that's it. But but to see that, and then like you said, like Bahrain, for example, mm-hmm. the gold in Bahrain, because you know how much they love gold, 
to see. We were there when they were having the gold show. And it made rappers look like really conservative. Okay. <laughs> you so know they're showing I mean? off their, their their gold because that that's their thing, right? And it, they they love it and they they make it. They by hand, they build all these beautiful, but a lot of the stuff is just ornate and way over the top, but it's part of their culture. And and just seeing things like that where it opens your mind because I'd never seen anything like that before. Like when you go to dinner in Italy or Spain, you're like, oh, that's how you're supposed to eat. Exactly. That's dinner. I'll tell you what I thought was <laughs> mind what was mind blowing to me was I can't remember if it was Abu I think it was Abu Dhabi. But the sheiks or sheikhs they say over there mm. live like they're not like like here you don't know where politicians live. You don't know right. where there they make a point of it. Yeah. So they're like, all right, the sheikh's house starts right here. Right. Three songs play, and it was like, and it ends right here. <laughs> Yeah, the palaces are are crazy. When um when I did Iraq, we actually stayed in Saddam Hussein's vacation palace. Oh my goodness! Which was in it, and the funny thing about that though, a lot of it was built like a Hollywood set because Saddam was insane. Like like he was he it was it was it, there were parts that he like he built a, an incredible healthcare system for the country right that, and the that highways, worked. but. The soccer team lost in an international match, and he shot them all. Everything. You know, like he was he was insane. So he loved this ornate stuff, but they realized he just wants to see it, and he wants it right away. So they would build it like a movie set. It wasn't real. It, it just looked real. Right. And he was happy. But anyway, we stayed in this vacation palace, and he had built bedrock for the kids. He, the, he had them build, like, Fred Flintstone's house and Barney Rubble's house. And so that was for the kids to play in when they visited, when the dignitaries and everybody visited the palace. And then one time while they were there, he killed all their parents like that. That's how. So when I say he was insane, I'm talking about, you know, bipolar on steroids. Right. right. This guy was it was. But, but to experience that. Is, is something that you don't get to do. And then like when I was talking about the food, again, I don't know if you've had this experience. When you have dinner in Italy, it takes three hours. So this is all I want you to do. Because there's seven courses to dinner. Like we think pizza. Hold on, hold on. Tell me about Italian dinner after the break. Okay. All right. And we're back from the break. Thank you for tuning in uh, thus far to the Nate Jackson Super Funny Comedy Club podcast. I'm here with esteemed guest, uh, Alonzo Bowden. And we are now talking about worldly perspective and Italian dinners. Yeah. So what I was saying, so you sit down and we think pizza is a meal. It is. No. Yeah, meat lovers is you're pizza's, fulfilling. Pizza is a course in the meal. You'd have like pizza, then you'd have salad, then you'd have a main course, which would be some sort of meat Right, and then pasta, the pasta. These are all different courses within dinner. In one setting. Yeah, but you. But the thing is, you don't eat a lot, and you're there for hours. You're there for three hours talking and eating and hanging out and having a good time. It's like, like you know, in a movie, The Godfather, right? Like that. That's, but that's just how they, they do it. And I was in Spain, and, you know, in Spain, they, they still take, um, they, they, what did, um, siesta, you know, middle of the day. Right in the middle of the like, day, everybody's off. We're, we're chilling. So I was at this coffee shop, and this Spanish guy was there, and he just he said, you know, you Americans live to work. We work to live. Yep. And it was like, yeah, I think you guys got to figure it out. <laughs> <laughs> you just got a straight break in the middle of your day, every day, for and, nothing but just chilling. And then they go to dinner from like 9 to midnight, and then they go out. You know, to kick it, to yeah, yeah, and, and it's just there. So again, the the thing about the international travel is you learn these different cultures. The other big gift of doing USOs, and you know this, you've done it too, is the the troops. They appreciate us bringing it to them. Oh, yes, and we get to show appreciation for the sacrifice they make. Like people don't realize when you're in the military and you go overseas, life is not easy. It's oh. just everyday life. 
you know, it's hard. It's a pain, and, and it's they call it Groundhog Day because it's the same thing over and Every over. Day. And this and that. Everybody's wearing the same clothes, yep. right? You got to shop on base. You know, I remember going to base and say, man, Sean John, really popular here. <laughs> <laughs> That's all we got, yeah. <laughs> you know, so yeah, it's been it's been a hell of an experience. So I didn't do USO. I did MWR, mm-hmm. which is uh, for Marines. Marine uh, Welfare and Rapport, I think, is what it stands mm. for. And so I did, um, that's how I did a lot of the stuff. And it was it was really interesting. I, I, USO, is, is, I'm sure you felt the same energy, but with Marines being first in, like, we were performing for kids yeah. that were headed into it. And that's the other thing people don't understand. Like, you can sign up for the Marines and be, like, 18. So I was... This is three, four years ago for me, and I'm talking to kids that they're younger than me, mm. and they're going to war. People don't realize how young the military is, and people don't realize the military, like, country. Because it's a lot of people from small towns and the country and stuff that this is their only opportunity to get out. That's why they join. Right. So so that is who the military is. Yeah, you don't realize it till you get there, and you're like, wow, you guys... Like, you really are kids, you know? Right. Like, yeah, like you said, a lot of them, not 21 yet. It looked like a high school football team. Yeah. <laughs> that could shoot their ass off, was headed into war. And they were. Within four days, they're like, yeah, we go in. And one guy's like, dude, I'm nervous. Another guy was like, shut your bitch ass up. Yeah. Like, all the energy was in the room. Yeah. And uh, here we are, two exits north of the largest military installation in the Western Hemisphere, Fort Lewis, uh, Joint Base Lewis-McChord. And so... We get soldiers from all over the place at in forty thousand batches, forty thousand per batch. So you can see the guys that are those guys. It's the, when you see like the the white guy with the buzz cut wearing his standard issued boots in the club. It's like, <laughs> fam, you don't have no other shoes. He's like, nah, I'm just I'm here till the war. Like yeah. you see those guys, but the Marines was everybody there was that. Yeah, in yeah, the I army got- you might get a couple guys that are extra motivated. Mm-hmm. It was the standard in the room for these kids. Yeah. But, I mean, they were making, like, these nuts jokes. I'm like, you guys are going to war. These nuts. You mean, just kids. Well, they're out. You know, they're out. They they left home. And and it's mind-blowing for them. Yeah. You know, so, um, yeah, I appreciate it. The USO, back when I was doing it, was it was bigger. Like, the the MWRs were more the individual bases, and the USO would have these big tours sponsored by, you know, Big corporations and stuff. I loved it. It was great. It was a uh, it was a hell of an experience. So, so I'll say this. I think it's very interesting that you've managed to find the joy in the, uh, you know, you you found the joy in the creases of the work. Yeah. Uh, and for a lot of us that are working as comics that are traveling and all that, we just feel like the moment we head to the airport, it's all work. But I'm kind of the same. Where I'll eat good and I'll treat myself well while I'm on the road. So I'm like, this is actually fun for me to do. Yeah, in a way, I mean, part of it was they do it for you, right? They take you places. And when you go to somebody's place, they want to show you their best. So they take you out and they, and then you, you know, this and that. But to me, the work, just what you said, when people are like, how's work? Work is getting up in the morning, going to the airport, another city, another grind, this and that. But once you hit the stage, that's that's the fun part. And then these other things that happen, you know, the military is just a unique organization because they can allow you to play with military toys. You know, I always wanted to blow up a ship. They wouldn't let me. I was like, come on, man, you guys have accidents all the time. Let's, let's just make let's, an accident. Let's blow up a fishing in boat. Cu- in Cutter, we were trying to, we, they, okay, so in Cutter, we were trying to shoot, I mean, Lunell specifically wanted to shoot a Gatling gun. Yeah. Right? Just say, it was Couldn't nice. do that. No, no. So they did let us, but they did let us drive the bomb demolition robot around. That was yeah. fun for literally 20 seconds. Mm-hmm. It was like, this is not, this is a drone. So then it got to the point where they just let her drive a Caterpillar bulldozer, just move a bunch of dirt and shit around. And then we signed bombs. Yeah. Well, what we got to do that was fun is when the Hummer first came out, Mm. when it was like the first military issue vehicle, the guy somehow knew I was a car guy. He said, hey, you want to drive one? And I was like, hell yeah, I want to drive one. And he was like, take it anyway. You can't break it. And I was like, what? He said, can't break it. Drive over anything you want. If you want, you could drive it through the river. And I wanted to. The other comics didn't want. I was like, "Man, y'all come hey, on, man, come just on, get out. Me. I'm gonna go and I'll come back and get y'all. I'll be wet, but I'll but be back." That, that was crazy because because before that they had jeeps. 
you know, and suddenly yeah. they had this Hummer and it was like, yeah, go anywhere you want. I was bashing through. They were like, yeah, drive right through it. They were like, no, you don't go around anything. You drive over yeah, it. They do not care. <laughs> yeah, that's fantastic. So speaking of being a car guy, right, I, I didn't know how much of a car guy you were until uh, the show. And I was like, oh, okay. I thought it was two wheels for you. Two wheels first. Yeah, it's bikes first. Bikes are my first love. Cars are uh, a now close you, second. You own 15 bikes? No, no. I've owned... I don't know how many bikes I've owned. Right now I have four. Um, I don't have room or money to collect them. But you got a super rare but, BMW. But, uh, yeah, I like flipping through, and, and I've had some some classics and stuff. It, it's, um, you know, I do Leno's Garage with Jay, and he has me on for all the motorcycle stuff, which is really fun. You do Leno's Garage with Jay? Yeah. Not um, I do Leno's Garage <laughs> with Jay Leno. <laughs> Homie Jay, got yeah, it. You get to know him. Okay. <laughs> That's how he is, though. You get to know him. But <laughs> Okay. You got a nickname for him? But I always tell people the difference between me and Jay is they lend it to me. They give it to Jay. Touche. That's the difference. They just hand They're it like, the whole. Yeah, Lonzo, you can, you can ride this for a week. Mm-hmm. No, Jay, go ahead and keep it. <laughs> so, so speaking of Jay Leno, do you um, also frequent comedy and magic down there with Richard? Yeah, Bay? yeah. Yeah, I love the Comedy Magic Club. I've only been once mm-hmm. because I was like, this is hella far. Yeah, it is. It's out of the way, but it is, um, it's one of those places that be, that's that been around forever. Yeah, and they have, you know, I saw the crowds. I was like, if they're doing this consistently, they're not messing around. Yeah, but but I mean, they've been there for 30 years. You know, there are some clubs ar- around the country, there are just certain clubs that they've been there so long, everybody's worked there and everybody still comes down because of the history of the club. Right. So that's one of those clubs. And then so. they treat you so well. Yeah. Cause just in sitting there for a few minutes, I watched the comics in the green room order roughly $500 worth of entrees. And yeah, they Michael, were not tripping. Michael feed everybody who's there. And, um, and, and the comic, I, I, do, I met, I met a Richard. Richard was a really cool. Richard's a manager. Mike okay. Lacey's the owner. Richard's a manager. And Hi, um, Mike. the, the comics are the, you know, the generosity goes both ways. You know what I mean? Like there was a point some where somebody embezzled a bunch of money from him. And a big name com you know, it was like, I, I don't know, like Leno and Gary Shandling and, and Ray Romano and all of these superstar comics that it came up there just kept going in doing free shows. Until they were good. Until he got his money back. And they were wow. like, okay, you're good, you know. That's a that's a relationship, right? That's a history that a comedy club has. So as a comic, when you start working there and you get in, and that now you you know it's about getting that respect, right? The money money is is one thing, respects another. So when you become a part of something like that, when you get to hang out and become one of the comics, that is a, I love that. I love that feeling. What do you think carries more value and weight right now? Being a regular at the store. Or being a regular at Comedy and Magic? I can't say because I've never been a regular at the store. So being a I've regular never... at Comedy and Magic <laughs> <laughs> is obviously the answer. No, I have, a, I have a weird relationship with the store, right? Because way back when, you know, 20-something years ago. Missy's alive. When, yeah, and I went to the store. And in the 90s, the store wasn't the spot. It was down. It was down and out. It was, it was the comedy store, but it was Definitely not the the A room of, you know, Sunset Strip or whatever, right? What was? So I'd say the Laugh Factory was. Jamie? Yeah, Jamie was. And the improv had its own thing because the improv's part of the chain. Mm-hmm. And and they had A&E at the improv. And the Laugh Factory had a show. I, mean, I don't remember the name of it, but they had a TV thing. But anyway... I was in at the Laugh Factory. I was doing regular spots at the Laugh Factory. I went to the comedy store. And Mitzi was like, eh, come back in six months. And I was like, why? Like, I don't need this. You know what I mean? That was my attitude. You know, I was a bit cocky. You know, But I was like, I don't need this. So I didn't. But were you? So, well, I don't think so. That's what I'm saying. I don't think so. <laughs> so years later, and, and I never thought about it. You know, then I went back. Um, and this is what happened with the store in the early 2000s guys made the store the spot again. You know, I think it was guys like um, Bill Burr and Rogan and and these guys, they were doing the store all the time. And all they the were time. Building they and, put it and, on and the it, map. Put it, it just built a whole new audience. Guy Tory, you know, guy had yeah, yeah. Fat Tuesdays and it made it a thing again. 
So I went back and they were like, Alonzo, we love you. We got more comics than spots. And I just laughed and said, okay, so I guess I'll never be passed by the Y'all be blessed. comedy story. You and know? I've, I've heard that story from multiple yeah, comics. Yeah. And then their story goes to a point where they say, then I get a call and it's for writing my name on the wall ceremony. That it's So funny you mention that. I got called to do the um, club in La Jolla, the San Diego club. Mm -hmm. And I get there and my name is on the outside of the club. Is this your first time working there? And I was like, I never worked here. You know, and they were like, yeah, the manager loves you, man. So those kind of things, um, at this point, I got nothing new to show them. You know, I am who I am. So if it's good enough for your club or your spot, great. And if it's not, then that's okay, too, because I got, no, you know what I mean? There's no, no new trick, like talking about Montreal. Like, I'm under no pressure at Montreal because I'm not going to be discovered. Hilarious. <laughs> you know, you're going to be discovered. I'm like, man, it got to be right. You're going to be like, discovered. Let's just have a drink and talk I'm not going to be discovered. Yeah. You know, but 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 I get to see friends that I only see there that I see once a year. That's why we call it summer camp because it's the one time a year we all get together and hang out. And it's all good. It's 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 great, but um yeah, it, it's it's I don't know, man. I'm solid, I guess. I, lo I love my career. You know, and I tell people all the time, it'd be nice to have a few million dollars in the bank. I ain't going to lie. That, mm -hmm. that, that's a nice cushion. But I've done okay. Mm -hmm. I've done okay. The rent's paid. I got some toys, you know, and, and I've had this incredible life experience doing this. I know everybody, mm -hmm. you Hurt know. Enough to say, Jay. You know, well, you know, it, it's. Plus, you've done the show he liked me. Ten times. He something. liked me. That was the way it was. If he liked you, they would call you just regularly to do the show. And I was fortunate that he liked me, and he would just call me to come down. And I was like, yeah, okay. Yeah, I'll come to a set. I got, I got time. I got right. time for you, Jay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll show the TV real quick. So I'll, I'll, I'll use a different talking point as a segue, right? Just uh, That's how I'm doing this. You mentioned that Montreal is what you guys have given the moniker summer camp. I've also heard the term summer camp recently, but it was in regard to some event that Dave Chappelle is putting together in Ohio. Yeah. Before we went live, we were talking about the nine hours battle back and forth mm -hmm. between Dave and Dane Cook. Right. And I wanted to know your perspective of that. Well, let me start by saying I know both of them. I love both of them. And I get Dane Cook. See, a lot of people didn't like that. Dane's always had a lot of haters throughout his entire career. I've known Dane. Let's see, when did I meet Dane? I met Dane in 99, and he's always been the same guy with me. When you say you get Dane Cook, does that mean you don't get Dave? No, no. You're what just I'm saying, no. when everybody else doesn't get him, I do. No, what I'm saying is that there's a lot of haters on, like, if there's any Dave Chappelle haters, you're wrong. Right. <laughs> Easily. <laughs> you're wrong. But with Dane, there's always been a lot of haters, but I've never been in that, you know, that group. Like, I get it. And I understand. And when people talked about Dane's fame, Dane's fame was, it wasn't everybody. Dane wasn't for everybody. Dane had a a following that was insane, Ridiculous. but it was all young people. It was like people under 30. Like it was my space. There was one, right. So there was one point where I said, yeah, if you're under 30, Dane is the second coming of comedy. If you're over 30, you're like, who's Dane cook. And, right. and that's just the way it was, you know, but, but, and a lot of comics hated on, and no, I wasn't that. So when they were doing that, I don't know what I don't know what inspired it. I think Dane was the first one to just keep going for hours and hours, right? And then Dave did it. Dave must have just looked up the record and been like, "Yeah, I, I got this." The difference is, you know, all due respect to Dane Cook, I'll pay to listen to Dave think out loud. You know, Dave Dave has gone to the next level in comedy. Dave's in in a world by himself now. There's no one you can compare now to. In this, in my opinion. There's no one you can compare to what Dave Chappelle's doing, right? He's he's just developed his own, you know, it's it's he's his transcended. World. He's transcended. That's a great to word. A level where we usually assess and apply to people who've gone on already. Exactly. Like when you talk about, you know, the Mount Rushmore, this or that, like to me, doing social observations, right? I always said Carlin was the greatest ever in social observation. He's on the wall. Well, not anymore. Now Dave is. Right. Dave has surpassed Carlin. And you normally, when you talk about a Mount Rushmore, 
you don't watch somebody do it. But we've been right. Watching, it's everyone who's dead already. We've watched Dave become the the, the goat. Yep. Who who can you you can't even you know and and he's so his confidence and he's so what he does like he doesn't even have to be funny because he can tell you what he's talking about and then make it funny when he did when he told the story of Emmett Till in the midst of a comedy like do you understand <laughs> right you told one of the most painful horrific horrific civil rights violations i mean the m- murder the beating death of a of a 13 year old kid and then brought it around and still made that crowd laugh again before they went home. Are you kidding? Nobody would bring up Emmett Till in a comedy special. Like, you just don't say something that... You don't go that dark. That heavy. That I don't want dark, the whole to dig sad, out of it. Yeah. Right? And yet he did it, and, and then you walked away. And it was like, yeah, we're done. <laughs> you know, we're, it's a wrap. we're done. Comedy's done. Dave's, Dave's mastered it. You That's know? how it's done. And, I, uh, I, I, and he's still... He's still a super generous guy with his time. Yeah. He's cool with people. Yeah. You know, that Dave Dave blows people's minds by just talking to him because he'll just talk to you. And and it's it's there's no ego and he's not coming from a place of, you know, let me talk to you youngsters or let me tell you what it, you know, he's like just talking to you, just like we're talking now. People don't know that though. You don't until you meet him. And so I'll tell you that my the way he talked on his last special about the times that he met OJ, I'll mm-hmm. say uh, the third time I met Dave Chappelle. <laughs> Maybe the first time Dave Chappelle knew I was meeting him. Okay? Uh, second time I met JFL, open bar, JFL. Uh, and Dave comes in, it's him, Donnell, a few other people. And when he comes in, the whole room is like, shabash, 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 shabash. Mm-hmm. and they just come lean on the bar. He's like, y'all want anything? Yeah. I'm buying. And everybody's <laughs> like, it's just free. He's like, ah. And everybody gets hammered at this open bar. Yeah. And that's the, that's the second time because we chopped it up real quick. So the third time, uh, third time is improv. Mo Better Monday, D-Race hosting. Uh, I'm on this show. And I don't do that show that often. I, I like Spike. I like Spike because Spike is like, you know, real tough to everybody. But yeah. me and Spike chop it up and he gives a great, you know, he's got a big heart. You got to get through that tough ass porcupine outside he's got. I could not get a JFL showcase at this time. And this night in the uh, satellite room or the, uh, mm-hmm. uh, the other room, they were doing them. So I figure, hey, Spike, put me on your show. I'll come down and finagle Jeff Singer right. through that little side door <laughs> to watch my set. Right? That's my plan. That's why I'm on the show. And so I'm on the lineup and all that's going fine. Jeff is actually like, you know, I'm not supposed to leave the showroom. and I have to see all of my own stuff going on. Like, that's not how this works. I'm like, okay, cool. And then I was like, but I'm going up in 10. Right? So I'm still like, I have a shot. Because there's a twinkle in his eye. I go back into the showroom. D-Ray's like, oh, man, you just missed it. I said, "What missed what? Oh, Dave Chappelle's here. Okay. He wants to go up next. I said, nigga, he can't go next. <laughs> He's like, what you mean? I said, I got the guy next door talking about he going to peek in. And he going to watch my set, and I might get JFL off of it. D-Ray been done JFL, so he's like, Dave Chappelle's next. I don't care about that little punk ass opportunity, right? I'm like, man, I'll be right back. He's like, where are you going? I said, I'm going to get unbumped. And I walk across the back of the improv to the corner yeah. booth, mm-hmm. and Dave's there. Was like, he's chilling because, you know, he's going up next. I was like, listen, uh, Brother Chappelle, man, listen. Uh, I'm on this show right here, right? And I just got a little, I, you know, I had like a 15-minute slot or whatever, but and I'm next. And you're going to do whatever you do to places. But if I could just do a portion of the set I was booked to do so the guy from JFL could see me and give me just a, a smidgen of a chance, I would be grateful for quite some time. And he was like, What's your name? I'm like, Nate Jackson. He's like, only because you came to me so humble. Look at the humility <laughs> of it, nigga, right? Do your thing. So I go back to D-Ray. I'm like, nigga, I got unbumped by Dave Chappelle. Yeah. D-Ray's like, are you lying to me? 
Because as a host, he's going to go up and say right. whatever. He wants to make sure I didn't just come back and finagle the situation. Are you lying to me? And I'm talking about piercing green eyes or whatever the fuck color his eyes are. He's staring at me. D-Ray, I'm unbumped. I don't get my full set, but I'm unbumped. He's like, I'm going to put you up. But if you're lying, I can't save you. I'm like, cool. So I go up. I do like seven. And I'm like, I was, and, I, and it, honestly, it was a rocking ass seven. I like, cause I, I didn't care no more. I'm like, fuck it. He's here. They're here. Fuck it. And I'm rah, rah, rah. all right. I was going to do much more jokes tonight, but my time is up a little earlier than we expected, but you guys are in store for a phenomenal moment in time. I've been Nate Jackson and I walk off. D-Ray comes up. The next motherfucker don't need no introduction. He walks off. Cigarette smoke billows through the club. They see the bald head, and the crowd is like, get the fuck out of here. Fuck it, don't, don't, rah, rah. You know what I mean? Like, and that was the girls yelling. Like, <laughs> the guys, I don't even want to. So, and I was like, wow. And he does maybe 45 minutes. It was, and, and the whole reason Dave was there is because he was upset because Faison said Dave only does white rooms. So he's like, I'm here for you niggas to show Faison fuck him. <laughs> so, congratulations. And he does 45 minutes. He's like, well, where's Faison? The fuck, right? Like, that was his whole thing. Mm. So that was my interaction uh, with Dave. And then the whole, again, the JFL thing is a through line. But, yeah, I think he's uh, he's definitely, he's among us at the same time. This is what I think. I think that because he knows his audience is the whole of the world with the focus on America, that he can write his material for their ear. Whereas where I'm at in my career, I have to write my material to be objective for whoever the fuck is in the room that night. He writes his material for Dave Chappelle. I get that too. That's a good. That's a no, nah. because Dave Chappelle wouldn't need to hear about him until no. But what I'm no, what I'm saying though is he writes it. It's what he wants to say. Oh no, it's for not. Sure. It has nothing to do with what they want to hear. Mm. It's what he wants to say. That's what I mean when I say he writes it for Dave Chappelle. Like there's no one. Like you were doing the showcase for JFL, right? And I do stuff like that. I may have a corporate gig where I boy like for Dave. He doesn't do any, he just does it for Dave. He doesn't have to do it for anybody. You know, like he did, what was the last special, right, where where the critics gave it a zero. Is that where you talked about George Floyd? Right, and Rodney. Well, that was that, was, that, how, was no, that a special? No, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the special, his last full Netflix special. The Requiem Bird. The, the critics gave it a zero. Uh, Rotten Tomatoes, the audiences gave it a hundred. Right. And he won uh, an Emmy for it. Yeah. And when his Emmy speech was basically like, see, fuck y'all. Literally. I got it. You yeah. know, I just won that. You know, that was his his Emmy speech was like, fuck y'all. Mm -hmm. You don't know shit. You know, and that's what I mean by he does it for Dave Chappelle, you know. Um, yeah, I've, I've, I've known Dave. Dave over the, a critic. The there is no time, critic that Dave's about to listen to. <laughs> the first time I met Dave. I wasn't even doing comedy yet. I was in a comedy class. I did one of those comedy writing classes. What, what you, class had Dave Chappelle in it? No. this. So it was at a theater in Santa Monica, okay. and they used to shoot um, Comedy Central half hours there. So he uh, what's was, the theater called? I, I can't remember the name of it. I think they it. do the showcases there. No, no. It's it, This theater's been gone. It's okay. been gone a long time. What was it called? The A-List? They used to do a show there called The A-List, right? Okay. So Dave was there to tape the A-list. And mm -hmm. I was there, you know, during the day they were doing the comedy. So I just met him, you know, like, hey, what's up? You know, blah, blah, blah. And we talked for a minute. And it seemed like he remembered me. Like I saw him a few years later. And I'm like, how the, how the hell Dave Chappelle remember me? You know, but but we've always been cool. But the last time, and this was really funny. So Dave was doing a tour with uh, John Stewart. Okay. And I was in Boston. And they were coming to Boston. So, you know, and I say it all the time, like, I know Dave, but because I know Dave, I'm not going to call Dave and ask for tickets because I might hear back from him and I might not. You know, his phone's blowing up all the time, right. this, that, whatever, right? So um, so I bought tickets for the show, and I'm there with uh, Colette Greenstein, who used to run a club in Boston. And the day before the show, Will Sylvans, I don't know if you know Will. Yeah. Why you, why you, why you? Yeah. Yeah, so Will is hosting, okay. which I didn't know. So I called Will. I'm like, yo, man, I'm in town. He's like, oh, cool. Come backstage. This is gotcha. whatever. Yeah. yeah, right. So so anyway, so I'm hanging out. So I come in and I sit down in the audience because I want to watch a show from the audience. I met Stuart and Che was there and I know Che. So it was Michael all Che? Good. Yeah. Okay. So this guy's talking, right? Like a row or two. And I was like, yo, man, 
Like, heck, like just having a conversation. Yeah, I was like, yo, man, shut your ass up. Shut up. We're here to hit, you know, and I said, man, just shut up, right? So they they wrap it up, right? And Dave, Dave's like, any nerds out there? And then and they're like, well, he said, like, any NPR nerds out there, right? And they like, he said, because my friend from NPR Wait Wait, Alonzo Bowden's here. Alonzo, come on up, right? So I stand up, and the dude was like, he lost it. He was like, oh, shit. You know, you <laughs> That's who told me to <laughs> shut up. <laughs> and I just went on stage, and I got the, you know, we just sat there and kicked it for a while. It was really funny, the four of us just talking shit about, like, Will would set it up. It was almost like a panel. And right. then we would just riff Crush on it. all the way down. It was fun, but that's weird. But the great, my greatest Dave Chappelle, like, thing, he used to throw these parties, man. He, um, and he was in, in just for, at Just for Laughs. Mm-hmm. And he threw this party, and it was insane. He had this band. He had, a like, a jam, a New Orleans jam band, right? And it was his own thing, private club, but everybody it was invited. You yeah, yeah. Just you couldn't bring any cameras, no phones, none of that mm-hmm. shit. And and I, you walk, I walk in, and on stage is Dave Chappelle, Most Def, Wanda Sykes, and the band singing "Why Can't We Be Friends?" And the whole and it was like this is this is not real. Surreal. Like this, you know, it was it was so much fun. Yeah, he's uh, he's he is who he is. You know, he is who he is. So this is what we're going to do. We're going to go to break one more time, and then we're just going to tell them where to find us. And then um, uh, you do your dates or someone else does them? Uh, your people? You mean, yeah, I have a publicist who does them, who will tell you. Okay, because I was going to have a little parlor trick where we book you live on the show. <laughs> <laughs> I've had a fantastic time on this episode of the Super Funny Comedy Club podcast. Myself and Alonzo Bowden have chopped it up in a way where uh, I, it's been refreshing. Refreshing. I'll take that. Refreshing. I like refreshing. It's really, I mean, you know, uh, we hadn't met before this. No. We, well, you didn't know we met before this. Okay. We've been passing, shook a hand. Yeah. What I, I mean, that happens in comedy. All the time. Right? Just, you know, mm-hmm. well, you outside the club, you're like, oh, that's Lonzo. Lonzo, mm-hmm. what's up? Hey, what's up, man? Yeah. And that's pretty much it. Then you get yeah, on the bike, and you're Our gone. Goes. I'm like, oh, he rides bikes. Yeah, that's, that's about right. Yeah. So, about right. Um, Interesting enough, interestingly enough, Corey Holcomb is headlining this weekend, and Corey was like, "Yeah, man, I was on my my bike the other day and seen Lonzo and his. He didn't know it was me because I had my shit on." And then he was like, "Oh, Corey!" <laughs> <laughs> He's like, "Man, Lonzo's six four, man. man. You can't just be riding up on anybody without knowing what's what." <laughs> so I love Corey, man. I love Corey yeah, Holcomb. That's, that's my OG. Yeah. So I just want I just want to do the you know classic. Just where can they find you? Uh, where, what, uh, just, what's next? What you know? You know, AlonzoBowden dot com is, is obvious. So, what's next is an interesting question. Okay, because I'm going to hype this because I hope it happens. All right, I'm gonna be your hype man. So say it All slow. Right. KBLA, KBLA, fifteen eighty, fifteen eighty, unapologetically progressive talk radio. We don't give a fuck, and we're thinking about it. <laughs> <laughs> it's a new station, a new AM talk station in LA. We are supposed to launch. Um, Soon, you can find it. It's already on YouTube. It's already online, kbla.com. It's already where? Online, kbla.com. Mm-hmm. And YouTube. So we're, we're, I'm hoping that happens, and I will be one of the hosts um, on that show. So, yeah, we're hoping that happens. And other than that, man, just, you know, the website tells you where I'm headed. I'm, I'm always headed somewhere. So the, the world's opening back up. I've been vaccinated. I don't know if you've been vaccinated. Two Moderna's like, in that arm. Yeah, once you get that second shot, you just feel like I'm invincible now. Start going raw in the world. Exactly. Exactly. So Straight I'll up. be I'll be out there and um you know, we'll see. This is great, man. Your club is fantastic. Thank you, you. This studio, everything you're doing, man. I'm trying, this man. This is big, just, man. All I did was just try to bring some dreams to it's fruition. Big. You got a rich uncle. Somebody. No, I I, I got a I did this the hard ass way. I got a Half a million dollar construction loan by the grace of God, and then I raised six hundred thousand with angel investors, and then I went through Ooh. the blood, sweat, and tears, and growing pains of working with people who do good work but don't manage the work they do well. So here we are, fought through Corona and all that, and hoping that we can keep on going forward from there. As far as the club, make sure you go to superfunnycomedyclub dot com. That's where all of our dates are updated. Please look. For the Alonzo Bowden dates, I'm going to try to close that shit after this shit is over with. 
<laughs> okay, because there's no proximity clause on that on where you're at right now, way up there. And I want them to be successful too. I, I love both of those those owners. So I mean no disrespect when I say what I'm saying, but you guys know we want Lonzo too. Um, and then uh, you can follow us on the Instagram at Super Funny Comedy Club. And then oh man, we just got season two greenlit. For, I'm, a, I'm on um, Young Rock. I don't yeah, know. congratulations, yeah, so man. Playing Junkyard Dog. And so mm-hmm. season two is greenlit, uh, and now they go to write it. Yeah. So I'm fingers crossed that they keep my character in the shit and even give me some more stuff. Hell yeah, man. You know, and, Network um, TV. This It's exciting. So Definitely. I'm, I'm hoping that I'm hoping that, that happens. So um, Now, do you meet The Rock doing the show? Is he involved? Have you met him? Okay, so no. Okay. Not in person, but... Almost up to, um, I'd say ten times via Zoom, where we're all doing all the table yeah. reads and everybody's chopping it up. And he's, you know, he wanted to get to know everybody chemistry wise because uh, he wasn't allowed to go to Australia where we filmed it. We were in Brisbane. Oh, okay. And so the week they were taking everyone's paperwork and everyone's doing all the testing and stuff, he caught COVID. And so he was on Instagram saying myself and my family, and they were like skirt. So he had to oh, watch so went to Brisbane. From Atlanta. They did it in Brisbane. Yeah. So they made all of Brisbane look like. Here, because they drive on the other side of the car, on the other side of the street. Right. And they got all Hawaii plates from the 80s, and then they changed all the signs and all everything. You know, yeah, well, that's do. Hollywood. They know how to do but that. It wasn't a set, though. I'm talking about we went into neighborhoods and, right. just, and just shut just, shit down. Just changed the neighborhood. Yeah. Right. And they're just like, crikey, what in the fork is going on over there? <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> it is going down as an American truck drives by on the right side of the road. No, I just asked because he's, I, I, want, I can't even imagine what he would be like. Like, as a person. Okay, so I can only this, think of him as a character, so I have no idea what the person would be like. There was a moment that I'll share where it may give you context to his personality. It may not. But I think I think the closest we are to the actual Dwayne The Rock Johnson is watching his interactions with Kevin Hart. Okay. Where he's just fun, funny, yeah. cussing. But so Nanachka Khan, the, um, the writer and director of Fresh Off the Boat, mm-hmm. Uh, came in and spearheaded the whole thing for season one of this um, and uh, wrote it and everything. And so then handed it off to Je- uh, Jeffrey, Jeffrey Wright, not the Jeffrey Wright, the first no, person to him, but the, the white one that was a childhood star. Yeah. So she does the pilot and then she has to go back to LA for a week, then Atlanta. To, then that's where The Rock was because he's working on Red Notice and Black Adam. Mm. So we get to have a rap party for her. NBC's black card, everyone is fucked up. Okay. Like, and I knew, and we know we're about to be like that because she tells us, all right, and then that's a wrap on me. And everybody claps. And she's like, the party's tonight. Everybody show up at the, the Dirty Onion or whatever it was mm-hmm. at six, and we'll just go until we go. Have what we want. And I'm going to go back to the States and start on season two. We're like, all right, bet. So we have one more table read the next day before she hands us off where she's, where he's directing this, but she's, you know, I, I'm turning over to Jeremy, and, and, and Dwayne's there. He's in a box, and that's exciting because he's on once a week or something. Mm-hmm. So everybody's all, you know. And I was reading for him all of the scripts for the days he's not. Yeah. So I don't know why I said this, but I'm like, are you going to be drinking tonight, Notch? And she's like, no, because my flight's so early tomorrow. And I was like, you can get on that plane drunk. I'm going to get your little ass fucked up. I say this, right? This is Dwayne. He's down in the camera. I say that. He looks up and he's trying to track who says it. And then he's like, <laughs> and then he goes back to his notes. Mm-hmm. That's his spirit. Yeah. That fun. Mm-hmm. We're also getting the work done. Work yeah. hard, play hard. That's what I feel was, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And so until I sit down with him and tell him to have some coffee or whatever the hell he's willing to drink or eat with me, then I don't know. But from that interaction and then watching, I mean, he was very emotional. Like he would st- he would cry during readings because it was his family yeah and and all the actors look so much like people that have you know left his life unfortunately right. that he you know it was it's a, i'd imagine that's a lot to take mm-hmm. in to look at somebody that looks just like your father who passed and sounds just like him tell the kid version of you that looks just like you then i love you and you never really remember hearing that from him, right. your damn self yeah the rock was choked up at several moments but great dude yeah. so i'm just glad that there's a season two uh just for the Success for him to show his family, for everybody and all the people that I met and that we worked with. Because we, when you go to another country to film, it's not like L.A. L.A., they're like, cut. Everybody's like, Brr, we all go our way. There was like, where y'all eating at? Because mm-hmm. we're in another country. Yeah. And so 
uh, I hope, you know, that uh, we come back. Now, I'm, I'm in the, the picture that they did for the press day where they, uh, they gave like a thousand pictures to all the, the places. 90% of them used the picture of me. And I'm like, n- I'm not high on the call sheet. So uh, around the world is me going <laughs> with, my, you know what I'm saying? So I hope that notoriety just through that well, is enough to get me in season two for a few episodes. That's all I can ask for. I'm going to tell you this. You've already beat me because I've never had a season two. See? But every show I've done, I've never had a season two. So it you made it. You Nobody said record yet? You made it. I'll take it. You made it. Speak, season two. Speak that into existence for me. You can just, you can just quit it. now. You won. <laughs> I got to do a frame of you footage won. first. You quit. It's, it's over. Well, I'm so, going to Africa. There you go. There you go. <laughs> Stop paying taxes and go to Africa. Cape Town.